Hello, dear students. As part of your study of the making of contemporary India, today we shall talk about the McDonald Award and the Pune Pact. At the end of this class or module, you will be knowing what the McDonald Award is about, what the provisions of the McDonald Award uh, was, the background of the McDonald Award, why it was introduced, and the circumstances leading to the Pune Pact. So let us first talk about the McDonald Award. What was the McDonald Award about? When was it introduced? The McDonald Award was introduced on 16th August 1932 by the British Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald. But what I want to stress here is a provision of the McDonald Award that uh, allowed the depressed class to have separate electorate. Depressed classes were essentially the scheduled castes or SCs today in India. For much of the period of British rule in the Indian subcontinent, they were known as the depressed classes, but from around the 1930s, the members of the depressed classes began to call themselves Dalit or suppressed. The term more appropriately signified their socio-economic position on Hindu India than the colonial term depressed classes. Replaced after 1936 by the scheduled castes or the Gandhian term Harijan meaning God's people. Now, what about the second term, the separate electorate? Separate electorate in India under British rule meant that not only were the seats reserved for a specific group, but voting for the reserved constituency was allowed for only members of that specific community. For example, only Muslims could vote for Muslim candidate in Muslim reserved constituency, etc. It is generally believed that when minorities fear they would not get representation in state affairs and government in joint electorate, then they demand separate electorates. Now let us go into that important question as to why separate electorates were introduced for the depressed classes. Was it unique? Did the depressed classes have a voice? To know that, we need to go back in time to look at who or what the status of the depressed classes were. As you know, the depressed classes were the most suppressed uh, in India. They were outside the four caste uh, system, Brahmin, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra, as you can see on uh, the screen. And uh, they were subject to much degradation. They were not allowed basic uh, facilities like access to clean drinking waters. They were disallowed uh, to access water from wells which the depressed, uh, which the higher castes uh, were drawing water from. They did not have uh, facilities for going to school. Uh, even their uh, sight was seen as polluting, so much so that if a higher caste came across a depressed class, he would have to go through, uh, you know, uh, ritual cleansing. However, with the uh, colonial rule, things somewhat changed for these depressed classes or untouchables. For the beginning, the Christian missionaries, they began to work among the untouchables and uh, they tried to provide them some education, make them understand uh, of their rights in society. And at the same time, the colonial government also sponsored special institutions for the spread of education among them. As a result, not only was a small educated elite group 
created among those classes, but in general, a new consciousness was visible among the masses as well. However, it would be a mistake to think that it was only the missionaries or the colonial government who was behind uh, their improvement, their gradual improvement. Because pretty soon, some remarkable reformers, some remarkable leaders arose from the depressed classes. You must have heard about Jyotiba Phule or Sri Narayan Guru. All uh, of them walked towards the amelioration of uh, the untouchables, and uh, they were all uh, anti-caste as far as their stance were concerned. As a result of these initiatives, these small beginnings, since the late 19th and early 20th century, there was a growing awareness among the depressed classes to raise their voice for legitimate rights and social equality, which had been denied to them over thousands of years. Meanwhile, the colonial administrators also uh, followed the principle of protective discrimination, quote unquote, which meant provision of special schools for the education and reservation of a share of public employment for such candidates. And finally, as we will see in the McDonald Award, representation of these classes in the legislative councils. Slowly, there was a marked change in the relationship between the depressed class and the higher castes. Because by the creation of new job opportunities and opening up of new channels of mobility, the colonial rule challenged the legitimacy of the existing Hindu caste system and made the depressed class conscious and emboldened to assert for equality and political rights. Now here, you might wonder, what was the Indian National Congress doing as a political body? Because it was one of the most important political group, the political uh, platform, which actually helped in the freedom of this nation. Frankly, the Congress did not have any social reforms in its agenda till 1970, that is from its inception in 1885 till 1917, the Indian National Congress actually avoided uh, these sensitive topics like untouchability, but they had to take it up when Dalit leaders had organized themselves when, and they were about to steal the initiative from the Congress. And from the beginning of the 1920s, there was a rise of Dalit movement in various parts of the country. For example, a small beginning was made by the Maharaja of Kolhapur in May 1920, when the Akhil Bharatiya Bahishkrut Parishad, or the All India Depressed Classes Conference, was held. However, the actual pan-Indian Dalit movement at an organized level started at the All India Depressed Class Leaders Conference held in the same city, but a little later in 1926. Here, the All India Depressed Classes Association was formed with the famous Dalit leader, M.C. Raja of Madras, as its first elected president. Dr. Ambedkar, who was a rising star at the time, did not attend the conference and he was elected as one of his vice presidents. Soon there was differences between uh, Dr. Ambedkar and M.C. Raja, and Ambedkar later resigned from this association, and in 1930, at a conference in Nagpur, he founded his own All India Depressed Classes Congress. As for its political philosophy, in its inaugural address, Ambedkar took a very clear anti-Congress and a mildly anti-British position, thus setting the tone for the future to course of history. There was differences between the two uh, Dalit leaders, M.C. Raja and uh, Dr. Ambedkar. Though they agreed on the upliftment of the depressed classes initially, 
their views differed on political representatives of the depressed classes. And this was pretty visible during the Simon Commission agitation. The Simon Commission, as you know, was announced and formed by the British government uh, to see whether or recommend whether India was ready for any uh, constitutional advance and along which lines. But uh, you probably would know that it was an all white commission and therefore the Congress boycotted the Simon Commission along with other major political parties. However, the depressed classes supported the commission and uh, here MC Raja demanded a uh, separate electorate for the depressed classes. But uh, the Simon Commission at that time, they rejected the demand for depressed classes. Thereafter, India passed through a tumultuous phase. Gandhiji launched the civil disobedience movement a couple of years later. And uh, things were moving fine, but the British government realized that uh, it was gaining popularity. So it began to arrest uh, uh, the Congress leaders and Gandhiji was also put behind bars. Repressive uh, policies followed and ultimately the government realized that its uh, policies were backfiring. As a result, a, concil uh, as a, result, uh, a conciliatory gesture was put forward and uh, the government asked the Congress to attend a roundtable uh, Congress to discuss possible uh, a solution or way out. But uh, at that time, the Congress did not attend the roundtable conference because it wanted uh, the government's stance on constitutional advance. As the roundtable talks failed, uh, the government had no option but to call for another second roundtable conference. Here I should mention that Dr. Ambedkar was present in the first roundtable conference and he put forward the demand for separate electorate. He stressed on separate electorate because he argued that many of his comrades were in its favor. Following this, on May 19th, 1931, the All India Depressed Classes Leaders Conference was held in Bombay and they formally resolved that the depressed classes must be guaranteed, quote unquote, their right as a minority to separate electorate. During the second roundtable conference, which was attended by Mahatma Gandhi, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar was also present. There were a lot of misgivings with regard to how the depressed class would be represented. Dr. Ambedkar wanted separate electorate for the depressed classes, while Gandhiji was vehemently against it because he knew it would lead to the, a break within the Hindu community. Therefore, uh, one can say there was a, a failure of dialogue between the major leaders at the roundtable talks. After the failure of the roundtable talks, the government constituted a committee in December 1931 under Lord Lothian to decide on matters concerning franchisee. This was known as the India Franchisee Committee or Lothial Committee. One of the directives given to the committee was to ascertain whether joint electorate or separate electorate would be effective for the depressed classes. A very significant development around this time was an agreement known as the Raja Munje Pact between Raja, that is MC Raja and BS Munje, who was the president of the All India Hindu Mahasabha. The MC Raja group was a staunch supporter of joint electorate and the working committee of their All India Depressed Class Association in February 1932 deplored Ambedkar's demand for separate electorate and unanimously supported joint electorate with the Hindus with provision of reservation of seats on the basis of population. The Dalit leadership, one can say at this time, was divided quote unquote down the middle over the electorate issue. Meanwhile, in 1932 May, the Lothial Committee submitted its report and within a few months, 
the communal award was announced. Now, here it is relevant to ask another question. What would the British gain by allotting separate electorate to the depressed classes? The answer is, and this is what the nationalist historian point out, the British hoped to win undying minority support for themselves. Secondly, the British wanted to undermine the arguments of Congress's radical leadership that they alone spoke for India's united nationalist movement. And if you know a bit of earlier history, we have examples because in 1858, after the crown took over, the Queen's proclamation actually weaned away the educated elite minority and the idea was to uh, move these group away from revolution or non-cooperation. Another question which one might ask at this time, was it for the first time that provision for separate electorate were being made? That is, were the depressed classes the first who were getting the benefit of such a provision? The answer is no. Because way back in 1909, the Mali Minto reforms had made a similar provision to the Muslim League. At that time, the tumultuous Swadeshi or the anti-partition movement was going on in Bengal and the British following the divide and rule policy uh, made this uh, policy to wean away the Muslims and it allotted separate electorate for the depressed classes. However, what is worth knowing is that the granting of this privilege of separate electorate by the colonial state in the Molle Minto reform of 1909, it elevated them to the status of all India political category, but more importantly, positioned them as perpetual minority in Indian politics, something which we are all familiar with today. And uh, extension was also made to the others in the government of India Act 1919, or which is known as the Montagu Chainsford Reforms, and later on in the Government of India Act 1935. Sheikhs and Christians, for example, were given special privilege in voting for their own representatives comparable to those vouchsafed for Muslims. Now it is time to look at the provision that were given or announced in the McDonald Award. First, Muslims, Europeans and Sikhs were given the right to elect their representatives through separate communal electorates. Seats were reserved for Marathas in certain selected general constituencies in Bombay. The depressed classes were given seats which were to be filled by election from special constituencies in which they alone could be entitled to vote in the general constituency. Indian Christians were also allotted seats to be filled by voters voting in separate communal electorates and so also Anglo-Indians. A number of seats were allotted specially to women which were elicited between the various communities. Special seats were allotted to labor, commerce, industry, mining, planning and landlords. Now what was the reaction of the communal award in various sections? The Congress of course was opposed to a separate electorate for Muslims, Sikhs and Christians because it encouraged the communal notion that they formed separate groups of communities having interests different from the general body of Indians. Because the inevitable result was to divide the Indian people and prevent the growth of a common national consciousness. But unfortunately, 
the idea of a separate electorate for Muslims had been accepted by the Indian National Congress as far back as 1916, that is the Lucknow session of the Indian National Congress, where it, uh, uh, as part of the compromise with the Muslim League, it actually had to accept the provision for uh, separate electorates. Hence, the Congress took a position that though it was op uh, opposed to separate electorates, it was not in favor of changing the award without the consent of the minorities. As a result, though they were strongly opposed to the communal award, they did not accept it nor did they reject it. However, the person who reacted very, very strongly was Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. Gandhi said, and I quote, which he wrote, uh, which you find in the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi. He says, and I quote, so far as Hinduism is concerned, separate electorate would simply vivisect and disrupt it. For me, the question of these classes is predominantly moral and religious. I feel that no penance that caste Hindus or can do in any way compensate for the calculated degradation to which they have consigned the depressed classes for centuries. But I know that separate electorate is neither penance nor any remedy for the crushing degradation that they have grown under. As a protest, Gandhiji undertook a fast unto death against that offer which he viewed as a nefarious British plot to win away more than 50 million Hindus from their higher caste brothers and sisters. Actually, this creates the backdrop to the Pune Pact. However, many were skeptical. Many political Indians saw in Gandhiji's fast a diversion from the ongoing political movement, but at the same time, they were deeply concerned and emotionally shaken. Mass meeting for his safety took place everywhere. The 20th of September was observed as a day of fasting and prayer. Temples, wells were thrown open to the depressed class all over the country. Gandhiji's fast, however, failed to impress Dr. Ambedkar, who preferred a political solution to guaranteed access to education, employment, and political representation. However, Bapu's deteriorating health as a result of the fasting led him to a compromise, and a series of negotiations started ending with the pact, the Pune Pact, which was signed on 24th September 1932 by Dr. Ambedkar on behalf of the depressed classes and by Madan Mohan Malviya on behalf of the upper class Hindus. What were the provisions of the Pune Pact? Incidentally, the Pune Pact is a very short document written in a quasi-legal style. It contained nine points, seven of which laid out the manner and quantum of representative of the depressed classes at the central and provincial legislatures. Separate electorate for depressed classes did not feature in the document. Instead, the pact put forward a system of joint electorates for reserve seats, which meant if the communal award had granted uh, separate electorates, the Pune pact was actually trying to revoke it. On the contrary, it reserved 148 seats, almost double from what the uh, McDonald Award had announced for the general uh, electorate. And the pact also called for non-discrimination of depressed classes in public services and urged for efforts towards a fair representation of the community in public services. It also contained a provision that proposed the earmarking of a portion of the, of the state's educational grant for depressed classes. Now we come to the results and significance of the Pune Pact. Of course, not everyone was happy with the pact. In fact, uh, the leaders of the depressed classes, including Ambedkar, uh, expressed reservation later on. 
because even though the number of seats reserved had doubled than what the McDonald Award or the Communal Award had offered, Ambedkar thought that separate electorates were crucial tools, were critical tools for political representation. However, it must be agreed that the Pune Pact not only provided adequate representation for the depressed classes in Indian politics and helped mainstream them, but it also acted as a cornerstone of the Constitution of India drafted later on by Dr. Bhimrao Ambedkar himself. Finally, Gandhi's success was in keeping the Hindus united for the greater cause of political emancipation and also ensured that the voices of the depressed class in the decision-making process was ensured. Thank you.